So I'll begin my introduction. Good evening to all the 12th grade students, parents, and high school counselors for joining us today. We truly appreciate your kind time uh, in the evening. We know it's about 5.36 here in India, and it's after a long day of school. So thank you so much for taking your time out to join us for this one-hour session. We have a very uh, interesting institution today. Uh, some of you may have heard about this institution, which is Minerva Schools at KGI. And they will be presenting on a novel topic, which is the future of education. To have, have us present today, we have two very uh, great individuals will be presenting. We have Mr. Naveed Ijaz, who's a regional manager uh, of Minerva. And we have Ms. Jessica Vergis, who's based here, right here in India, who's a regional associate. As I mentioned in my earlier talk, please make sure your questions are posted in the Q&A box. That's where the panelists will be looking for your questions and not the chat box. And of course, towards the end of the session, they will be answering your questions. The first 30 minutes will be about the topic for the day. And the second 30 minutes will be about the institution. Having said that, I'm going to right away hand over the stage as well as the microphone to Mr. Naveed and Ms. Jessica. Mr. Naveed, Ms. Jessica, Immense pleasure welcoming you for the Admissions 101 workshop series, and I wish you all the best. The stage and microphone is all yours. Thank you so much. So, Nam, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I hope I'm not mute actually, and you can hear me clearly. Yes, so, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, now, first of all, thank you so much for uh, you know uh, reaching out to. Uh, us and in, 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 in the time of COVID that everybody's going through, I think you're doing a great service um, for the students, for the parents, and a lot more for the counselors. Um, because, I mean, you know, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, um, and students are not sure about what's going on and what's happening. Parents are not sure about, you know, how the next six months are going to look. And counselors also, I mean, there's a lot of panic all around. And this is not just um, in Middle East and Africa or in South Asia. This is globally, this is the issue that people are facing. So let me just give a, a, a brief uh, sort of um, introduction or give you a structure of how would we, uh, how would this one hour, um, you know, go. So I thought like, you know, uh, when you reached out to us, I thought, you know, what can be interesting topic uh, that would address the current, I mean, you're keeping in mind of the current scenario and how it can help students and the counselors, um, you know, um, to probably uh, see things very differently and then um, find a solution for them. So uh, the future of education is something that um, I thought, you know, would be very interesting for not only for, um, I mean, you know, for the students, but also for the other stakeholders. So we will uh, briefly discuss future of education uh, between me and Jessica. We'll speak about that uh, for nearly close to 30 minutes. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll talk about after that present, I mean, you know, talking about future of education, what we'll do, we'll speak about Minerva schools at KGI and we'll discuss about the curriculum and we'll discuss about um, why Minerva is so different uh, we'll talk about, you know, the competitive, highly competitiveness of Minerva and financial aid, scholarships and all of that. So let me just, um, uh, you know, uh, start with the future of education. I think uh, for everybody, you know, this slide actually has a good detail. So you have my details, my information, my WhatsApp, and you have Jessica's email, Jessica's. In um, I think, you know, um, when, whenever we speak about future of education, it's very unfortunate that, um, you know, how people, um, the first thing is like how people see, um, you know, education and would they ever think about like, how would the, how would the future of education be? Um, and I think uh, specifically, this is not the issue just in Middle East um, and this part of the world, but it's an issue in North America as well as in Europe as well. So, um, um, you know, uh, I have come across a lot of students, I've come across a lot of parents um, who are actually, um, you know, go for those critical mistakes once um, their son or daughter is actually graduating and um, they actually deciding to go for university. So whether it's about uh, deciding what program they need to study or it's about uh, deciding like, you know, which university to choose to, 
um, none of us, and I, I probably would tell you that my parents probably would have done the same. None of us actually looks at where the world is heading, actually. And, you know, um, something that works now would might not work in four years' time because, you know, it doesn't matter where you go to study. At the end of the day, uh, you have a four years undergraduate degree, and by the time you graduate, um, you, um, you know, maybe the program that you're doing now might not have any opportunities for you later on uh, once you graduate. So I think if I speak about, uh, if I speak more about um, North America um, and I speak about Europe um, and UK, um, I think, you know, um, the higher education has moved from teaching to learning. So when we speak about how universities um, actually plan their courses, how they decide um, what they need to deliver, how they need to deliver. Um, one of the issues is like when we look at this side of the world, we still are using the word of uh, teaching. How would we teach students? Um, whereas when we look at the Western world, they have moved from, um, and, and this is not just now, I mean, um, they have moved more to meta learning. Uh, so there's a terminology being used, meta learning, um, which, which is a lot more focused on a, a student centric approach to education rather than um, a teacher centric approach to education. So just to explain to you and give you a classic example of that is like all of us, when we go to schools, when we go to universities, we, we go and attend a class, we have a teacher that comes and delivers a lecture. And what are we doing? We are just listening to that teacher for an hour or two hours, depending on if we're in school or university. And we're taking, and then what we're doing is we are preparing for exams. Um, whereas uh, when we speak about learning and meta-learning, and when we talk about the benchmark in education and where the higher education is going, um, learning is a lot more different. So, I mean, the focus is not what you teach, the focus is how can we make sure that the students that are you know, coming to us, the students who are becoming part of a, um, a university experience or four years of under, undergraduate experience, how can we make sure that um, you know, out of their four years of their education, they can, they, they can actually learn and they can be successful um, you know, in the job market. So I think, um, you know, there, it's, a, it's very interesting. There is a, there is a report that I just, just want to touch base. And a lot of us, maybe we haven't heard about it. So uh, when we speak about future, edu future of education, future of education sometimes is derived by future of jobs. The classic example is, you know, the scenario that we are going now, which is COVID-19. And, you know, so many people have been unfortunately off because of the, um, it, the uh, issues with the economy um, and um, so many other things. So I, I would encourage most all of you to actually download this report that gets published every year. And it actually talks about, you know, different roles that exist today that might not, ex that would not exist by 2022. And when, I mean, you know, like I said, when you go through this report, this report actually discuss in a lot more details how machine learning and technology is impacting everything. Like not just, like, you know, sometimes we think, okay, you know, when we speak about machine learning, machine learning is all about computing or artificial intelligence, or it's all about robotics. But I, I mean, you know, a classic thing that I want to share with you, if you look at uh, this slide and you look on the top, you will see from automation to aerospace, uh, from aviation to chemistry, biotechnology, consumer, energy, utilities, technology, financial services, global health, IT infrastructure, mining and metal, oil and gas, professional services. So it, it actually touch base every, every profession that you want to actually uh, go for. Let's say if you want to be a doctor, you want to be an engineer, um, you know, this, this actually speaks about how much of machine learning will impact a particular industry. So imagine if we are not aware of, so let's say um, if we are not aware about what's happening globally and where the world is moving and what kind of new jobs or new roles um, that would start by 2022 or that would start by the next three to five years. And we are still deciding over uh, like the, most of the decisions that we are taking or the decisions that we, um, when, when it comes to deciding for a university, uh, we are still taking on the basis of like, you know, um, no research and as to where uh, my friend has gone or where my cousin has gone or where somebody else has gone. I mean, it, it would impact us greatly. 
and I think when I speak about, uh, you know, uh, when you speak about globally, when you speak about the population, you, and I think, you know, um, if we speak about uh, uh, during COVID-19, so majority of the population is actually going more, moving more towards poverty rather than moving upwards. And one of the biggest issue would be like, you know, um, it's our education uh, on the basis of which we actually, I mean, that that is our source of learning actually, for the students to actually opt to go for um, their undergraduate degrees or for the students who are going for their postgrads. So mostly you make your living out of your education. So if, if you are deciding, um, you know, if you're deciding without thinking, and if you're deciding like, okay, you know, let's just get into university, uh, you know, and then we'll see, you, you probably would face a lot of issues uh, moving forward because one that, um, uh, you know, um, we, we live in a global economy. We live in, um, in, a, in a market that's global. So um, it, it's, it's not that if I am based out of uh, Dubai or somebody else is based out of Qatar or somebody is based in Europe, it would not impact them. It, it would definitely impact them. So I think um, another thing that has happened during COVID-19 is when we specifically speak about education industry, it has exposed us big time. Nobody, nobody, when we speak about the global, like, you know, the benchmarks in education industry, whether we are talking about a top schooling chain in Western societies, or we talk about the top or the best of the best universities, I mean, it has exposed everybody. Nobody was actually prepared. These guys were not prepared for this. So what are the issues that are coming up? So the major issues that everybody is facing is the professors are not like, you know, they're not really happy to teach online. Um, secondly, you know, the, the curriculums are not being designed that way. Thirdly, um, you know, I think mostly what I came across globally, the students are being promoted without any exams. And, uh, you know, for, for this year at least. So imagine, I mean, fair enough, some of us, we would be very happy to be promoted, but imagine when, when the industry that we need to work on is already struggling and, you know, the education that we are getting is not actually preparing us the, for the skills that we need for the job market. It's going to become a huge issue uh, for us to survive in this competitive world. So I think, um, I think whenever we we actually um, look at um, you know um, in fact I think before we go there I think one thing that I would like to discuss and I I would like to give an example of um, and this is very this was very interesting that I came across it was the ratio of human versus machine working hours so um, if you see they have, I mean this report has given a comparison between 2018 and 2022 so you know where um, in 2018, on any aspect, um, humans used to rely on machines for 19%. It has gone up from 19 to 28%. And then, I mean, and then and these are different aspects. So when you look at information and data processing, from for, it went from 47% of relying or depending on machine to 62%. So think about a world. And, you know, and when you look at these aspects, when you look at reasoning and decision making, when you look at coordinating, developing, managing, advising, communicating, and interacting, um, you know, performing physical work, complex and technical activities, and all that, this happens in every role. So even if you're a doctor, you would be um, involved in decision making. If you are working as a manager, if you're in hospitality industry, if you're in, uh, you know, biotechnology, if you're in, uh, you, work, you want to be a psychologist, you are working as a psychologist, um, or you are a technical manager or you are an engineer, each and every element within that is going to impact on, um, you know, uh, that machine, machine working, machine learning is going to impact on how, uh, the, how your role would change in the future. So my, my, my suggestion, whenever I speak about a future of education and, you know, whenever I speak about future of job, it's very important for us to understand that, you know, um, uh, what exactly is required um, out there in the world. So I think I can give you another example, like, you know, when we go to any university globally, like not just globally, if, if you look at within your own countries also, every university will tell you we produce the best quality graduates. Whereas when you go to a particular, any, any company that you go to, the companies will tell you that the graduates that we are getting are not employment ready. 
and I'm not taking any names. I'm just giving you a general example. So, I mean, I think we, we need to understand that where exactly that gap lies. So, I mean, if, if, you, if the higher education is giving a different perspective or different example altogether, and if the employment or the, you know, where we are supposed to work that, you know, the employer side is giving a very different, um, you know, output to that, uh, then obviously there, there is a gap that exists within that. So I think it, it was it was very interesting uh, uh, within within uh, all the research that has been done on meta learning and all that that you know it speaks about um, how uh, we can make sure that we give transferable skills to the students. You know we we give the students the ability to think critically to 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 have critical wisdom to think creatively to think um, you know to um, you know to be able to negotiate to be able to um, you know, uh, solve complex problems. So I think when we speak about the education system for now, and we, when we speak about, specifically we speak about higher education, and I'm sure, you know, when you ask your parents and um, if we have, you know, or when you ask your counselors and you ask them, okay, you know, what, what degree did you study and which university did you go to? And, you know, did you learn these kind of skills? Did you learn how to think um, how to have critical wisdom? Did you learn how to actually, um, 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 how to sort of think creatively? I mean, did they teach you how to negotiate? Did they teach you how to solve complex problems of the time? So um, I think they will tell you, okay, you know, I, like, for example, I studied business from England. So I can tell you the only thing I learned was more on uh, marketing, finance, human resources, and you have a teacher that comes, delivers a lecture, you listen to the lecture, you pray for, prepare for the exams, and then you give the exam, you pass the exam, and then you go out and you work. So, I mean, um, in fact, it's very funny. I was actually talking to, I think, probably 50 people somewhere in Middle East, and I asked them this question. Like, you know, how many of you, um, one of the questions was, how many of you uh, know how to manage people? So one of the person attending that uh, workshop uh, actually raised the hand that I know how to manage people. So my question was, my question from him was, do you know how to manage people because you studied human resources in your MBA that, you know, because he told me he studied MBA. Or you know how to manage people because it's a skill that you acquire. And he did not have an answer to that. So imagine like, you know, um, I think, and the education system is, uh, or the edu the higher education is, is there to prepare us, um, you know, for a future. It's there for us to have a better future, actually, and not just in a specific country, but globally. So imagine if we have people around us who are better decision makers. Imagine if we have leaders around us who, um, you know, who are who need who have that kind of critical wisdom. People who have. Uh, who have creative ways of thinking about problems and being able to solve problems. Um, and then where would that come from? So definitely we need to have, we need to have, a, um, you know, a, a curriculum. Uh, we need to, uh, we need to have a system that is being designed on those ways or where the, uh, you know, uh, so, so we are ready for the, for the future that is coming up. So, I, what I'll do now is I think I'll, I'll probably hand it over to Jessica and, you know, Jessica, do you want to share some, uh, like, you know, something you want to add on to this? Yes. Thank you so much, Naveed. And I think, thank you for sharing such insight, insightful information. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I just wanted to start off with the, uh, the fact that how a lot of schools have switched virtually right now. And uh, I just want you to ask yourself this question uh, when we go, uh, as we go forward with the session and as you also go forward in choosing your uh, uh, university that how have you, how many of you have, have enjoyed class? Is a uh, class really engaging for you right now? Are you able to grasp any matter or are you using techniques to probably block out your video and do something much more reasonable with your time, right? A lot of us, while uh, sitting in a classroom also, don't pay a lot of attention uh, because we don't have to do any pre-work. We do not have to come prepared to class. 
uh, we can just walk in, a professor or uh, a teacher would come into the class and they will uh, make sure to explain a topic they have in mind and they will simply move forward. Uh, are your classrooms interactively based? Do you get a lot of uh, question-based, curious, curiosity-based answers within your uh, learning environment? And are you able to convert whatever you've learned uh, into like practical application? And if we look at a lot of schools in and across India, uh, I don't think there's, uh, there's a lot of practical application uh, uh, from the knowledge you've gained in school. Because look at our unemployment rates, specifically in India. We have a lot of youth who are graduating from engineering, who are graduating from medicine, arts, uh, graduating from like uh, in the field of commerce. But how much percent of that uh, population is actually heading into the work industry? So that's something you need to ponder upon and check with uh, uh, your uh, future university as to the kind of skills you're gaining before you even move towards that uh, aspect of life. Uh, even in school, if you see, as we moved forward to like a virtual based seminar uh, in uh, during the pandemic time, I have, uh, I have worked in schools in and, in and around India and I've seen that it's basically a lecture style class when someone is directly talking to you for one hour straight. Uh, and the interaction in that classroom is not engaging because it's just like a one way conversation that is happening and uh, education is not really uh, being represented at its roots in terms of a learning centric manner as Naveed earlier mentioned. So the questions which come to mind is how do you think we can like take a minute and maybe you could probably populate this in the chat, but how do you think a classroom could be more engaging learning and fun. And I think I think while you're thinking, just to add on to Jessica's point, um, I don't know if you guys have come across um, how many universities have been sued in, just in a North America, because I mean you know the students' point of view was, and I, I'm sure it has happened globally. I know a lot of schools have been like you know the parents have actually complained, like, um, because, uh, you know when the classes have gone online why a student needs to pay $60,000 for studying in a university when, he's, when, it, when the student's sitting in Middle East and taking a class online. So it's 60,000, I mean, that's what I meant when I was talking about that the universities have been exposed freely. And one of the fact is like $60,000 or $75,000 in um, East Coast or West Coast, um, actually when the student now realize, okay, you know, at the end of the day, all we will get is an online lecture. And do we really need to pay that $60,000, $70,000 or $50,000? So there has been, an, I mean, this inf information is available online. You can actually go through how many students have actually gone to the court that the fee that we are paying should not be the same as to what we are paying. So it's very difficult for the universities to actually uh, defend on that. Because, I mean, what, used to, what students used to get when they used to go to the universities I mean, you know, they used to obviously go to the campus, they used to use different facilities and not all that. And this is, I mean, what we believe in that your cost of education has a lot of other indirect expenses that you end up paying, which is not necessarily that you need to pay. So the cost of education should not be that high, but when you actually end up going to huge campuses where there are uh, grounds and everything else, and there's a lot of stuff related to that, students are the ones who end up paying. So Jessica, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much Rahul, Arman and Shwetan for answering. Yes, two-way interaction is You think uh, better if your classmates, your teacher, your teacher, your teacher can get it wrong. Shwetal, your answer also makes a lot of sense. You've mentioned actual practical uh, hands-on learning. So for that, you basically require 
to, to get out of the classroom and experience what you've learned in a classroom by doing a particular activity, which would directly translate to you understanding that particular topic, right? Uh, and Arman, yes, I would totally agree with your answer, gaining knowledge that will actually help when running a business, right? So basically you're trying to say that we need to gain skills required uh, to function in this job uh, force that we are entering into the future, uh, wherein all these, all this knowledge that we gain is transferable in a manner that would uh, create an impact and consequence for you, which is beneficial to you. So all of which will be, which it, all of all of these points which you've mentioned is actually part of Minerva's entire program, and it's embedded in our offerings and. Uh, uh, Bumi, your question, I will answer as we go ahead into uh, the presentation because it's part of uh, the presentation and it will automatically be answered. Uh, but yeah, uh, based on all the answers we've I, I've mentioned above right now, all of these are aspects which are really, really necessary for you to make sure that you're gaining some outcome out of a class. So. Can you tell me whether or not if you walk into a class and you walk out of the class, will, will you be able to specify what kind of learning outcome you've had in a class? I don't think institutions in India have that particular system because I am a product of that system. And I think everything I have learned was a byproduct of me, uh, me personally taking interest to work in the sector I wanted to work in. So it was something I pushed myself to do, but I did not see university, universities pushing me in a direction that would lead me to be where I am right now. Uh, so taking all of your answers into consideration, all of this is part of Minerva's uh, offerings and what we generally do with our students and communities, which Naveed will touch base on. So this was a perfect transition of uh, uh, giving you an overview of what we do at Minerva, and Naveen will take it. Naveen will take it over from here. Yeah. So I think I think um, I mean uh, I think the interesting end to the first part of the conversation, which we 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 had on future of education. Of course, it's a very vast topic, and we can end up talking for hours. But we just wanted to give you a scoop of it. And secondly, I think I think these are some of the questions that I I whether you're a parent, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a student, to ask yourself, and this, this is not just something that would apply to higher education. This is something that you can, you can look at when you are thinking about sending your son to a school also, or sending them anywhere. So ask yourself this question, how does a university should look like or looks like? So, um, and then, you know, make like, start taking points as to like, you know, what comes in your head, like how, how our university should like, you know, think about like maybe some, some of you might come across 10 points. Uh, some of you might come across 20 different aspects that you, that comes to your head uh, when it comes to a university. And by the way, you can add on some points if you want um, in the Q and A's. Um, what, do, what do you think or what do you look for in a university? So ask yourself a question when it comes to us, deciding for higher education, what exactly are we looking for? What makes a university a good place? Questions. And, um, you know, whenever you're moving from question one to two or two to three or three to four, or you can go in any order. My suggestion would be that you actually uh, add point you have written in the first question. Okay, then, like, for example, you know, when we are talking about a university, uh, for some of you, uh, what um, like I said, you can add up, uh, some of the sort of answers in the, into the chat and we can look at later on. It. Some of you might, might look for some of you, um, a huge campus might be very important for some of us, and that might be the Perspective. For some of you, uh, post 
university or graduation employment opportunities that can be very important um so it it varies secondly i think one thing that i would uh, want you guys to take a note of and once you once we go back from this session um at the end of this um, like you know one hour long discussion is to ask yourself this question that do you believe in uh, that the knowledge that we gain is actually giving us the skills also that we need so how many of you think that what we learn in the school and what we learn in the university or in higher education actually gives us a skill also so um let me just stop sharing and so i think um arman is actually talking about gaining knowledge that will actually help uh, okay sorry this was before so my question to you guys was um um like you know in terms of how many of you believe that um you know what we, uh, the knowledge that we gain is actually giving us the skills any one of you do you all believe in that the knowledge that we are gaining you know some of you might say that every uh, the knowledge that we gain does add gives us the skill some of you might argue no we are not actually getting the skills even though we are getting the knowledge but i because of the because of the time issue let's just move forward and we'll discuss this later on with the q and a as well i think i mean you know the knowledge that we gain is not actually give, equipping us with the skills that we are supposed to learn out of it a classic example to that um is um imagine like you know um one of you does not know how to swim and then if i give you a book on how to be a good swimmer and after you read that book or you go we just go and put to the water to swim so the i mean you but it kind of gives you an idea that you know the books itself or you know when you go through uh, the information it is not actually equipping you with a skill so uh, and this is the reason that you know that the gap that exists uh, within the education and industry also it is out there so let me just share my screen once more so we have so um, i think we we did sp speak about the transferable and practical skills that we spoke about before um let me just move to the to the next thing, which is this was again related to the report that we were talking about the few so um, these were the top 10 skills they they spoke about would be needed by 2020 and we are at here already so they spoke about complex problem solving they spoke about critical thinking they spoke about creativity about coordinating with others they spoke about emotional intelligence negotiation and judgment and decision making now even if you're a student and you're in high school or you are you know whatever you went through the university and if your students go back to your parents once you go from and and ask them okay you know let's say some of your parents might have studied engineering some of in business or any other field within your four years of or six years of university that you have done your undergrad and masters did they teach you how to do how to solve complex problem solving did they teach you how to have critical thinking i mean you know did they teach you how to be more creative i think another question that i would like to you guys to think about later on is um can we teach somebody creativity can we teach somebody how to have critical wisdom or you know i mean these kind of things um so um and these are the things that irrespective of what majors you want to study and uh, where you want to go in future you would need those 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 things and uh, by the way um this is what we do at minerva so let me just um i mean you know i'll i'll go move forward with this um in in a bit so what what we do at minerva is minerva actually i am you know i think we we skip the part where we uh, was i mean sort of we should have given you a bit of introduction um so we we are a liberal arts college based in san san francisco california it's a highly competitive school um our acceptance has never been above 2% so when we speak when we say about acceptance so you know in in the us when people are applying uh most of you or most of the people think harvard is the most competitive school but harvard acceptance 
um, is somewhere close to 2.5 percent to 3 percent, and then all the other Ivy League universities. When you look into Stanford, Princeton, Yale, Columbia, Duke, their acceptance is up to up till 4 percent. So Minerva, Minerva's acceptance has never been above, um, you know, uh, 2 percent. Uh, but uh, you know, I, at the same time, um, Minerva does not have a quota system. So we are a school uh, that that you know that is unlike other universities like you know that we will only accept that many students so we we can accept as many students as possible so at times i have nobody qualifying from a particular country but we might have six students qualifying from the same school so when you apply to minerva you don't compete with each other so you compete for a spot for yourself so how minerva is different from other universities we 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 are very proud of the fact that we are a very non traditional school so what do I mean by non-traditional school? So when I say non-traditional school versus when we speak about traditional schooling or traditional universities, so, you know, like, you know, that education system that exists around us or it's out there is the traditional education system where you go to the class, teacher comes, delivers a lecture, you take notes, you sit, sit for, you sit in an exam and then, you know, you, you uh, actually get your grades and that's about it. So we don't do uh, thing, we don't do things like that at Minerva. So one of the one of the thing about Minerva is um, our mission is to nurture critical wisdom for the sake of the world. So we very strongly believe in that this world needs better leaders in uh, you know uh, leaders who I mean not just like I'm not just talking about politically. I'm talking about like whichever fields that you go in. Um, so that's why our curriculum is a lot more focused on. Um, you know, uh, these transferable skills. So the first year of your uh, education or first year of your undergraduate study, um, the curriculum is, I mean, everybody has to study the same thing and curriculum is a lot more focused on getting those skills or how we can make sure that, you know, you are better at problem solving. Um, you know, you can think critically, you can have that creativity and we'll discuss in a bit. So what in what other ways Minerva is different? One aspect which I just told you our curriculum is very different. So this is what you learn in the first year and in the second year you get to pick your major. Uh, secondly, um, at Minerva, I think this makes people very happy when they hear about it. Um, so at Minerva, we don't do any exams. So there are no exams actually. So, um, and the reason we don't do exams is, exam is a type of assessment. Um, you, know, you know, so as you can assess people in very different ways. So um, the reason we don't do exams is because there is a lot of research done in the U.S. and according to that, your your uh, you know um, exam is a test of memory. So, for example, one of you can be an outstanding student in the school, but because he does not have a very good memory, meaning like you know whatever two to three hours exam he or she is going to go through, uh, they would not be able to recall that information that you know. Um, that probably they have they've learned through rote learning or some of the other ways. So we don't do exams. So the way we assess you is on the basis of uh, class participation and on the basis of real life projects you do with the, with with some of the civic partners and some of the other location based assignments. Secondly, um, you know um, we our learning is very different. So what we do is we we send um, readings. We what we do we send pre readings to the students. So we do seminar based teaching where in a seminar setting we don't have more than 18 students so we send pre readings two weeks before the class to the students so within those two weeks if you want to reach out to the professor you can reach out to them you can discuss with them um, but when you come to the class you need to come to the class prepared so in the class you actually learn the application of the knowledge so one of the things jessica was talking about before is you know it's very important to learn i mean we we gain the knowledge but we never learn how to apply the knowledge so for example, let's say some of you might have, might have studied math. So you learn a math formula to solve a problem that exists in your book, but you never come across and nobody tells you that that math formula might have had an engine design because of that formula, that engine that has been running in a car. So, you know, those kind of things are never being shared or you never learn them through, um, through, through, you know, the actual real life experience. So, uh, this is what we do at Minerva. So whatever you learn in the in the class, you apply in real life. Um, uh, I think third, um, our programs were designed in a way that they were global programs. So a student 
not just study in America. So during their four years of study, they go across seven different countries. So your first year, I mean, most of the time you'll stay in San Francisco. So your first year will be in, in San Francisco. And then at the end, uh, you know, you would come back to San Francisco and you'll graduate. So after San Francisco, like the global rotation order can be any, you do a semester in Berlin, uh, you do a semester in, in uh, so after the semester you move to Argentina, you go to Taiwan, you go to South Korea, you go to London, and you know, we have Hyderabad in India as well, where all these students actually come for a semester. So what happens is, let's say some of you might qualify for the program, or all of you qualify for the program, and during the first week itself, we have created an event called Consequent. So during the Consequent, every city that you go to, we have civic partners there. We call them the partners in the city. So these people come and they discuss about different projects that you as a student can do. Um, and I think Jessica will speak a lot more in detail about it later on once I'm done explaining to you about other things. So what happens during the first year um, of your study? Um, let me just quickly go through that. So Minerva first year is common for everybody. Um, so um, it doesn't matter whether you want to do AI, want to study robotics, or you want to do business, you want to do social sciences, um, you want to do biomedical genetics or some of the uh, aspects in natural sciences or you want to study arts and humanities. Everybody has to go through year one, which is like, you know, considered as a foundation year. And you study four subjects, which is um, formal analysis, empirical analysis, um, complex systems and multimodal communication. So in formal analysis, actually, uh, you, we, we teach students um, how to, we teach them how to use Python programming and mathematic, mathematical modeling to solve the problems that exist around them. So for example, like, you know, if I am a student from, I mean, I'm also from Asia. So if I'm a student from Asia, and if I'm choosing to study maths, I might not study biology. Um, and computer science or language is not something that I would study in high school anyway, if I'm not a computing student. And again, Python is not a language that is very commonly used in high school anymore, even though within the university sector is being utilized. So, uh, so our, the way our learning differs at Minerva is we don't, teach, we don't teach student Python. So all the students who have qualified this year to Minerva, I mean, they, they enroll at Minerva by May 1st this year. So from May 1st till end, uh, first week of September, when they are supposed to come, they learn Python programming. So there's a lot of free work at Minerva that they have to do before they actually come. Then you study complex systems. So complex systems are, you see different complex social systems that, that are around you. For example, you can study the Indian economy and you can try and see what are the problems with it. If it's working fine, why is it working fine? Things like that. So after, and then you have multimodal communication, how to communicate, how to negotiate and all, you learn that. Um, then you go to empirical analysis. So this is what you learn in the first year. And then in the second year, you, you can pick and choose any of the majors, like I said. So broadly speaking, we have arts and humanities, we have computational science, we have natural science, we have social science, and we have business. I think one very important um, uh, thing that I would like to discuss with you is, uh, Minerva is a need blind school. So, uh, what do I mean by need blind? Um, and um, how does that translate for you? So Ben Nelson, who's the founder of Minerva, his vision behind Minerva was nobody should, nobody should be denied access to education on the basis of their financial ability and country of origin. So it doesn't matter, like, you know, if you are, if you are an Indian student applying from India, if there is a, a student from Sri Lanka or from Singapore, from Malaysia, from UK, from Europe, or from America, I mean, when I spoke to you initially about the quota also, so nobody at Minerva gets a preference. So if, if Jessica is from US and you are from India, that does not guarantee that Jessica will qualify to the program. Anybody that qualifies for the program qualifies for, for the program. So 85% of the students, 80 to 85% of the students that apply every year, sorry, that qualify every year are inter global students or international students. So we have around 10 to 15% that actually qualify from North America. And this is not because we have a quota. This is actually the students who actually qualify. And uh, the financial aid is open to anyone and everyone. So it's not that you have to be from US to qualify for it. Minerva's admission also, um, they don't look at your country of origin when they are assessing your application. So they wouldn't know Jessica is from US or the, anybody else uh, who's from Africa or any other country. So your admission will be on merit only. 
So financial aid is a need-based financial aid. So it depends on your parents' affordability or like their financial, sorry, not affordability, it depends on their financial ability. So what we do is we request, um, uh, we request you when you apply for financial aid to actually provide um, the parents documents. So if they have a bank account, if they have a job, if they don't even like, you know, some of the students that actually qualified from Africa that came to Minerva, their parents do not even had a bank. They, they had no job, they had no bank account, but they provided some of the other documentation that we request and they got full funding to study at Minerva. So when I talk about financial aid, need-based financial aid is on, I mean, the financial aid is on the basis of need that you are able to demonstrate. So it does cover your, your tuition and it covers your uh, living also, depending on whatever need you are able to demonstrate. So if I speak about on average, 82% of students that are studying at Minerva, on an average, they are getting 19,000, somewhere close to $19,726. The cost to attend Minerva for the next year would be somewhere close to um, approximately $33,000. And that's including everything. So, you know, when you get financial aid, so what happens is that um, because financial aid is only covering your tuition and accommodation. So when you go to US or you go to any country, you need money for food and traveling. So every student that qualifies to Minerva uh, is called a work study student then you work with us like, you know, it used to be uh, 10 hours per week. Now we, we, we change it to seven and a half hours per week, but we increase the salary. So when you, the students used to work 10 hours per week, they were getting $15 an hour. Now they're allowed hours are seven and a half hours per week, but they're getting $20 an hour. So the money that they are making in a month is, is the same, which is between five to $600 a month. And that money is for their food and traveling. So this work study actually stays on with you for four years. So it doesn't matter if you are on your global rotation city for, um, if you are in Berlin, you are in Argentina, you would have that work study. And during the summer, you know, uh, students actually uh, do their summer internship with their full time, they are paid full time. So um, it depends on you. Like some students we have, they prefer to go back to their countries and work there. Some students work in North America. So it's, 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 it's up to you. Like, you know, it's, we have a professional development agency that works with you from day one. And it's very different to any other organization or any other university. So it has three elements to it. So we have a coaching team that coaches you uh, from day one. Uh, we have a talent development team that makes sure like, you know, whatever is there in the industry, um, you know, they, they develop those skills in you as well. And we have a network, de global network development team that actually uh, know that the student body that we have, it's a diverse student body that comes across uh, from, I mean, last year it was 50 countries that actually came across from, and they are from India to Sri Lanka to uh, Nigeria to Kenya, Ghana to uh, Turkey and Europe, UK, Norway, Finland. So, you know, try and create opportunities for them there as well. So this is what they do. Um, these are some of the companies, um, you know, before we move forward to the admission process, some of the companies our students have worked in the past. Uh, just to give an idea, um, but there is a huge list and there's a lot, a lot more that they can, they can do and work with you. Let me just quickly go through because I want you to learn, I want you to know the student experience side a bit more. So let me just quickly tell you a bit about admission process also at Minerva. So Minerva is unlike any university. So when you apply to America, most of the universities are on Common App. We are also a university that is on Common App, but a lot of things on Common App we do not consider. So even though we are very, we are highly competitive, but we don't look into your SAT score. Um, and please, I mean, a lot of times students think that, you know, university that does not consider SAT, it will be very easy to qualify. I can just tell you last year, we had close to 26,000 students who applied, only 200 and like, I mean, the year before, not this year, only 273 qualified out of 26,000. And this was, um, the application came out of 192 countries. So our admission process is very different. Um, we don't look into SAT. We don't need um, letter of recommendations um, like other schools because no counselor in this world would write you are a bad student. We, need, we don't need a college essay because even though students write the college essay, so many people go through it before you submit. So our admission criteria is way, way different. Um, you go to our website and I will encourage you instead of going to Common App, go to our website and apply directly. 
So the admission process is a three part process that we have. Part one is who you are. So in this, um, you know, it's a form that you fill in. Part two and part three is where most of the students are not able to qualify. In part two, how you think we see how your brain works, how, you, how your brain operates. So the entire Minerva process, it takes you only one hour, 30 minutes to complete. In part two, um, you know, and part three, and of course in part one also, but in part two, you need actually a laptop with a camera because while you, I mean, in this part, you go through a series of challenges and while you are taking the challenges, the camera actually records you. Um, you know, and part three is we look at your accomplishments. We look at uh, six accomplishments in you uh, in the last three years. So let me give you an idea quickly about the challenges. So these challenges are um, yeah, divided, like there are six challenges and they are divided uh, differently in terms of time and all that. So, um, but there is no odd, they, I mean, you know, there's no preference in terms of, okay, I should I take this challenge today? I have to follow an order. There's no order to it. So for, let's say I'm, I only have 10 minutes. So there's a challenge called creativity, which is seven minutes. I can take that. There's a challenge called writing where we don't give you an essay to write, but it's more kind of like a prompt. There's an expression challenge, which is like an interview. There's a bit of math, reasoning and understanding. But I think later on also, we'll, we will give you your, our details. You can reach out to us. We can do more one-to-one -one and discuss in detail. Part three, like I said, accomplishments. Accomplishments can be any. It can be, um, you know, you have done some volunteer work. It can be you participated in competition. It can be you write a blog. It can be, um, you know, debating. You're into debating. It can be anything. So again, let's just move forward. I think, um, um, let me just give you an admission cycle. Uh, how does that happen? So with Minerva or, you know, like other American universities also, you can apply three times a year, but our applications, our applications work very differently than others. So we have an application that is early action that starts every year after 1st of August. So let's say if, uh, we have August 1st coming, but this year is not starting on August 1st because it's coming on a weekend. It will start from August 3rd. So if you want to apply the ed application is completely free. You can go online, you can apply. Regular decision one, the deadline is, um, it starts from November 2nd and the deadline is January 15th. Regular decision two, it starts from um, January 16th and the deadline is March 15th. And it doesn't matter what cycle you apply, you know, at the end of the day, um, you, you can, at Minerva, you can only apply once in a year. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you should apply when you are ready, your profiles are ready, you're confident about accomplishment. We are there to coach you also. We, me and Jessica and people like uh, other colleagues, uh, you know, um, people like us who work in other regions, they also do a lot of coaching, coaching for the accomplishment part. So at Minerva, when you do Minerva as application, it has two sections. So we have a regular application, a normal application. We call it non-binding and we have a binding application. So binding application, whether you're applying for every action, regular decision one or two, you can still choose between binding and non-binding. A binding application, the only difference between binding and non-binding is with binding application, we give you a decision within 28 days of you applying. So which means if I apply on 1st of August and I complete my application by 28th of August, my decision will come. But the downside of binding is that you have to decide whether you're coming to Minerva or not within 10 days of getting your decision. So my suggestion to some of you would be if financial aid is important for you and without that you are not able to make a decision, then maybe apply as non-binding. Because with non-binding application, you have time till May 1st next year uh, to decide whether you want to come and or not. And then, you know, uh, you get your financial aid decision of obviously with time also. These are some of the stats, uh, 26,000 apps, um, you know, this, this year, uh, the year um, I told you 273 students, 50 countries, 192 applicant countries, the admission rate was close to 1.1%. Um, that's what we have. Um, I think, um, let me just give it to Jessica so she can quickly tell you about um, the student experience or the like, you know, the engagement during your global rotation city. Um, and then we'll see how much time we have. Jessica. Okay, thanks, Naveed. Uh, so like how Naveed was saying, another unique aspect of our educational approach is basically the global immersion program. 
Peril Nervo students live and learn in seven cities across the world. So as you said, you start off in SF, uh, which is San Francisco, you stay there for a year, and then you spend a semester each in these following cities across the world, which is Seoul, Hyderabad, Berlin, Buenos Aires, London, and Taipei. Uh, so all of our students get to interact with both cultural and professional opportunities a student, a city has to offer. Students get the opportunity uh, to get involved in uh, their local environment by working with professionals, startups, uh, nonprofits to basically solve challenges around them. For instance, uh, a student of ours in London, she was a part of our first graduating class, but she wanted to work on mitigating the effects of climate change. So realizing that the consumer choices drive social progress, she teamed up with an organization called Halotex, whom she met through the Minerva Global Network. Uh, and she started to create a sustainable fashion module, which was called Black to Gray. And this particular organization uses recycled fabric and new technology to basically make environmental friendly garments. So this is one way how uh, Minerva can nurture you. Uh, and help you build a network and connect with people with whom you can potentially work in actually solving uh, complex world challenges across the world. Uh, another example would be uh, an experience from India itself, wherein students had the opportunity to explore the Bengal market here in Hyderabad, and they were made to understand how workers function, the profits they make, the role in their economy, how much are they earning, how much there are they spending, how they would contribute to the economy back again. And it also involved understanding cha challenges like working in unstable or unsafe uh, environments because they work with a lot of chemicals and glass and the environment that they work in doesn't really provide uh, a lot of uh, benefits in terms of them having like an insurance plans or like getting to reach a doctor or a hospital. Uh, so they uh, looked into challenges which workers were facing and they also had to deal with problems like child labor. So a lot of children were employed in this particular uh, sector of the market. So they worked with a startup in Hyderabad to understand how they can help them mitigate these specific problems. Uh, and coming to the cultural interaction with the city, uh, we have something called an art district in Hyderabad, which is basically uh, uh, an area which was gentrified and uplifted. And students uh, who were pursuing arts and humanities did like a research project, project on how uh, uh, uplifting this particular community and making it uh, 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 beautiful and making sure uh, that uh, uh, people are coming into their environment and visiting them and also that added to their profits as like there were a, a lot of stores and a lot of uh, clothes markets and there were a lot of tiny uh, uh, shops that you would find available in these in this particular art district and a lot of local artists would also sell their work so students basically inherently connected what they were learning in class and they went and experienced what they learned in class through like a practical learning uh, activity. So coming back to the point of, uh, I think Gumi's question of how would Minerva's uh, undergraduate uh, education help with bridging the skill gap and post-graduation employment opportunities. I think this basically your experience in a city in, in connection with your academics is something uh, which translates into a practical experience. So when you are here in any local environment, you are interacting not just with professionals, not only with startups, not just uh, uh, nonprofits, but you're also interacting with people and their culture. And once you take the knowledge you've gained and you apply that knowledge in these particular environments, you are learning to solve uh, problems solved for them and you're giving them the space uh, to uh, understand how you can help them uh, solve these problems. So that is how you would interact with the city and you would uh, 
basically uh, gain practical working experience in like a real time environment rather than creating an environment that is catering to it. So um, I think uh, just to share with you guys, like we, we have students who have graduated. Um, I mean, if you, if I just share the stats with you for the last, uh, last year, we had close to 60% who actually went for the job market and we had 40% who went for their PhD. So we had students who went to, who went to Harvard for PhD. I mean, I think one thing you need to understand in the US, you can do a PhD after your undergrad. So it's not like Asia, within Asian countries that you need to do your undergrad then you need to do your master's. And then you do your master's in philosophy or you go directly for doctorate. So in the US and UK and European countries, you can actually do uh, PhD or doctorate after your undergrad, depending on like you qualifying for the school. So most of our students, the 40, the other 40 percent that I'm just sharing with you, they actually qualified for schools like Harvard. We had students who went to MIT for PhD. We have students who went to um, uh, UC Berkeley, NYU. Uh, we had a student who qualified for Rhodes Scholarship. If you know Rhodes Scholarship, is a very prestigious scholarship. Um, you know, from UK for your postgraduate. And we have students who have worked in some of the, like, yeah, they're currently working in some of the Fortune um, 500 companies in the US as well. So one thing about US is like, you know, if you study in the US and you uh, um, you get, which is still out there, but I don't know as to what happens in the future. So you can work in the in the field or in the industry, uh, and if you do any other major, then it's it's a permission for one year. Can be for STEM years. Uh, guys, I think um, what we would welcome is if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us now. We sort of respond to your questions. Secondly, Minerva has another program that I quickly want to tell you. It's called the Visiting Scholars Year program. So for example, let's say if you are a student who applied to university this year, but for some reasons you are not able to go, it can be the university is not starting this fall. It can be uh, the embassy. Your first year at Minerva under the visiting scholars year. Um, and you can study for the first year, which I shared with you, and you can get exemptions uh, for that year going into other universities as well. So I've shared a link, but if you go to our website also, you can actually uh, um, as well. Um, and I think to encourage because I think that I doubt if uh, Kunal, I'm sharing. So it's a form that we designed for these students, uh, which is only a two to three minutes form, and we are more than happy because it give them different options as to um, would, they, they, would they want to schedule a one-to-one -one call with us? Would they want to know more about free of education? Would they want to uh, would they not want to know about curriculum or professional development or uh, you know the uh, the civic projects or so we are more than happy to sort of uh, respond respond to any of those questions and this form once you fill it up you send it across i mean either me or jessica will reach out to you also um to sort of uh, connect and respond to any questions that you have i think on the first slide you do have you have our email address and uh, our whatsapp also you know you are more than happy to reach to us uh, through that as well. Um, you know, these are our details and any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Navid. Uh, I think, thank you, Jessica, before I come online, I think there are a few questions in the Q and A, uh, that a couple of students have asked and, uh, you know, if you could kindly answer them. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So I think uh, the question that I see um, is, can you please share which countries you uh, you have international students from? 
so I think Arman, um, like I said, 85, 80 to 85% of our students actually come globally from, from uh, global countries. So um, I can give you an idea because I look after Middle East and Africa. So my region is, I'm responsible for all the Middle Eastern countries and I'm responsible for all the African countries. So Africa and Middle East forms 25% of the class every year. And this is not because we have a quota for it, but th this is how many students actually qualify. So like last year, 16,000 kids applied from Middle East and Africa. And Middle East and Africa includes Pakistan and Afghanistan also, besides the Gulf countries, besides like, you know, the North African and Afri the, the entire African continent. So out of 16,000 last year, I had around 54 kids who qualified out of 16,000. Um, and so it gives you an idea, but, um, you know, we, we had any nationality that you name, we probably would have that. So we have students from UK, from Germany, from France, uh, from, um, Finland, uh, as far as from Australia also. So we have some of the Australian nationals also studying with us and they qualified from Australia and they, they came all the way from Australia to, uh, to us. So, and I'm more than happy to connect you with, um, you know, let's say we have students from India also. So I think, I mean, I personally know like uh, two students from India who actually qualified from my region from um, Abu Dhabi. They were studying in Indian school Abu Dhabi or Abu Dhabi Indian school and they are outstanding. So, I mean, I'm happy to connect you with them. Uh, you know, one of the students, he's currently studying, um, uh, accounting actually um, he's studying accounting and finance and his first internship just to tell you like first summer internship that he did he did with uh, Tesla his second internship was in Japan he's only 20 years old and he has already started a company in blockchain technology with some of the other schools so maybe it might be a very good idea you know for you to have a conversation as well in terms of experience and all that and we are more than happy to to do the uh, you know to connect you guys so I hope it, this answers your question. Uh, when do we arrive on campus? Is a program a combination of online and offline learning? Okay, so um, Ananya, um, actually my, my suggestion would be for you guys to actually go on our website and see. So Minerva is a very different, um, you know, university experience. So um, what we do is our teaching philosophy is very different. So we, we, we teach through um, forum. So it's through seminars. So what happens is even though you all live together, so you, there are residential halls in San Francisco, you go to Berlin, there are residential halls and you have student experience manager, you have city experience manager, um, but you, you get live lectures. So you get live classes. So let's say if your school starts at nine o'clock and it's there till two or three. So it is the same at Minerva. So your classes are being scheduled and Friday is an activity day when you have a lot of engagement that happens with the civic partners. So it's, it's um, I wouldn't call it online even though we use the forum because online is very different as compared to, like people perception of online is very different. So my suggestion would be that go to YouTube, there's a video available on YouTube that is the forum Minerva. So if you search, it'll give you an idea about it. Yeah, adding on to what Naveen said, uh, it's not entirely online learning, but we basically use a platform for our, where all of your academics happen and it's technology. But then, as he mentioned, it's live classes and you are constantly interacting with a classroom. Uh, so we believe instead of uh, investing in like extracurriculars, like, like if you see regular universities have uh, big campuses, they have big libraries, so we've invested our uh, resources into creating experiences which directly cater to you gaining skill which is required for you to function in the workforce in the future. So that is how our learning is catered to on the platform. That doesn't quintessentially mean that you're learning online, like how it is right now wherein you're probably learning something virtually in school wherein it's a one way engagement. That's not something that you would expect, but I think the video will be able to add more insight to what we're looking for. I, I think just to give an example to that. So what we have done is we have created partnerships in, in every city. For example, let's say you are a student who 
wants to be a doctor and in the us you cannot study medicine without your undergraduate degree so because us offers an md program so you will end up doing natural sciences so there might be labs that might be required so we have partnership with actual labs for you to learn um instead of like you know uh, having a lab on campus uh secondly um i was traveling with a student um in kenya recently um i think and um one of the civic project that she did so um she worked with a big and she's hardly 19 years old some of the african students they graduate from high school at the age of 15 so in specifically in nigeria and some of the eastern african countries and the school cycle is interestingly also very different so like you know you guys probably go to school from september till um march or april they go to school from january to december so december is their final exam so she she were i mean one of the civic project that she took was working with the big, biggest telecom company um in in south korea like what's the biggest telecom company in india is it which one jessica which one would you say is the biggest sorry it's bsnl uh bsnl bsnl i i i don't know if everybody would agree to you but so let's say like bnsl bsnl of south korea actually wanted to build build an app using blockchain technology that can help people achieve their goals uh in life so the app that you know the student design is now launched within 45 million people in south korea so imagine like this is what you're doing she's doing ai at the same time she's whatever she's learning she's applying in projects like that and when you're doing projects like that you're not just doing project actual real projects and you are solving the actual problems but you are also making connection and building a network of uh, connections with uh, with those companies and those executives so one more thing just to add on so minerva has a uh, our partnership with the companies also differs um, so there are companies that only take from minerva and there are companies unlike any other student you would apply and the professional development would provide you the support and i mean i'm talking about summer internship uh so uh, we have uh, you know i don't know if you've heard of softbank in japan so we have students a group of students going to japan every year uh, to do internship um, at softbank so what the softbank does it is that they they place our students in all the companies that they have invested in so i think the year before there were 50 students who went from minerva to japan and they did their summer internship there so like like that we we try and create opportunities for you you know as as you go along i think when you look at i mean i can compare specifically my uk experience to the us and i can tell you like you know um i think when we go mostly more to most of the universities as an international student one that they don't care about us like you know they know like we're not from here even if we are from there you know it's not how exactly that the the system works or the job placement and those kind of things work so at minerva you are not just graduating with a four years of degree you have eight months of work work study every year and work study jobs are not odd jobs these are actual probably you end up doing research with a professor you might work with a technology team and at times we have uh, work study opportunities with with proper companies if you are not working within minerva so you are eight months into four years that almost 32 months of experience and you're gaining you're making money out of it also 20 dollars an hour and during summer so if you say like the summer is 4 months and on an average if you count like you do 2 months every year so that 8 months of work experience for you so on an average if you want to gain um experience alongside with your degree you are graduating with almost like 3 and 1/2 years of work experience working for the top of the line companies and you know gaining those kind of skills that we initially spoke about so is there any last questions that we can take i think we are definitely over time but yes anybody there is one question about the breakdown of tuition and uh, accommodation and meal expenses i think that would be the final question i can see here thank you sure. so much thank you so no, much no no problem no problem kunal uh, so uh, the the tuition fee at minerva is close to um, it's approximately 14000 dollars it's close to 14000 dollars the cost of living is all, almost close to 12 to 13000 dollars so combine it comes up to 25 26000 dollars 
and then we we tell student to estimate close to five thousand dollars as their personal expenses. So these can be indirect expenses. These are not the this is not the money that you actually pay to Minerva. That is the money. Let's say maybe your health insurance is compulsory in the U.S. So health insurance money. That is the money. Uh, maybe for your initial expenses when you come to Minerva. Um, that can be the money that can go for like, you know, we do have a housing deposit, which is refundable, you get it back that you pay. Uh, but otherwise, besides that, there's nothing else. So let's just talk about, let's say I'm a student when I apply to Minerva, my dad uh, is making, let's say, less than 50,000 rupees a month, just to give an example. So, I mean, and then we have three brothers or we have five brothers or you know, whatever the case is. So I apply to Minerva. Um, I apply. So when you apply to Minerva, you have to complete the application first, which is completely free. And once you submit the application, only then you can apply for financial aid and financial aid also has deadlines. So then the system portal opens, you, you apply to financial aid, uh, your financial aid, let's say you got 96% of the 96% of the financial aid, just to give an example. So you get, you get 96% or 93% of the actual cost, which is close to like $33,000 or $32,000 or something. So we also, you never forget that there is a portion of work study uh, that is yours, that is already allocated to you. But that does not mean that you will get it. You have to work for it. So let's say the university tells me you get like $5,000 through your work study, even though that funds are allocated to me, but I have to work for it. So every month when, when I'm doing seven and a half hours per week, for four months, let's say I'm doing 30 hours. So for that 30 hours, I'm getting the money that is allocated to me. Next month, I'm getting that money. So meal expenses, I'll tell you, you know, even if you are anywhere in India, if you start cooking, if you start eating from outside, of course, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But if you're cooking, so like, you know, let's say you're staying in residential halls. So there, there are, you know, there are kitchens. So if you start cooking there, it's very easy. You can easily manage with the money and you can save money. There are students who save money as well. So you can save money also within the, within the amount that you're making. We also have students who do not want to work. They don't want to work steady. I mean, there are students who are paying hundred percent. There are students who are on 70% financial aid. There are students who are 50% financial aid. And even with financial aid, we don't have a quota. So as long as you qualify for the program and you applied for financial aid on time, and on the basis of your uh, need demonstrated by, you know, the documentation that you shared, you will get the financial aid that you will get. So majorly these are the expenses. So, I mean, you know, going back to Kunal's question, if we are talking about uh, the tuition and accommodation is close to $26,000. If you're adding on meal expenses, meal, meal money is what you are working and you're earning anyway. And that money is more than that. But meal on average in San Francisco, it depends on you. If you're cooking at home, maybe two, three dollars. If you're eating from outside, maybe it's a bit more. And the eating two times or three times, obviously, that's another thing that you know counts also. But mostly students actually who, uh, I mean, I come across or who go from my region because Africa, some of, some of the African countries are very, very poor. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you, I came across two students uh, from Ghana. Uh, there's a school called African Science Academy and they qualified for Minerva two, two, three years ago, actually. They can, their parents cannot even afford um, two meals a day. And they have already been to India, they have already been to South Korea, they have already been to Taiwan. Um, now they, they, are, they are supposed to go to London, then go to San Francisco and graduate. So imagine they have completed their four years, they got maximum funding that you can get from Minerva and the money that they were gaining out of uh, work study. And during summer, they were doing full-time internships to make sure that they can support themselves during the study. Minerva is unlike any school that I come across. I mean, I've, I've been in education industry for more than 14 years. I mostly work with British universities. I studied from UK also, lived there for eight years. So I can tell you, um, I mean, growing up, we did not have money, uh, just to share with you. Uh, and uh, when we did not had money, like one of the, one of the problem was when I was thinking about applying and going abroad, um, you know, one of the issue was like, we could not afford, um, we could not afford the study. My, pay, my dad passed away at, when I was seven, so I could not afford. 
so when i heard about minerva and you know that is 12 years in the industry um i actually most of us we share the same passion that education should be open to anyone and everyone especially quality education and secondly um you know there should not be any quota that you know you come from a particular country would not qualify you should be qualifying on the basis of um you know on the basis of merit not on the basis of like you go to a ib school or a level school or cbsc school or ic school it should not be that okay one final question shweta which seven cities uh, do you visit okay so the first uh, city that you go to of course is san francisco so you are there for the, for the for the two semester or in other words the first year because mostly the students who actually go to san francisco they do their summer internship there so which means they stay for the full year after the first year the entire class moves to um you know berlin germany let's say so you do a semester in berlin from berlin you move to south korea you do a semester in south korea from south korea you go to india hyderabad india and i think you guys should reach out to jessica because she's a start of hyderabad um and you know she i mean the good thing is jessica was part of the team that was actually man, managing and dealing with student experience so she can exactly share you the different projects they did in india they did in south korea they did in argentina and all so then from uh, from india you go to taiwan for a semester from taiwan you go to uh, london uk and from london you go back to san francisco and you graduate and every city that you go to we have those partnerships we we created those civic partners um that you can um you you have the opportunity to do the projects and work on and guys one more thing um that i would um, you know i would like to share is um like i was saying minerva is unlike any school so let's say when i used to work for the uk um i used to have a target like okay you know i used to look after middle east and north africa i'm supposed to get 1200 students and it doesn't matter how i get so you used to like you know make sure we get those students and i used to always go to like private international schools because i would know the students can afford i used to never go to public school because i know students would not be able to afford and this is not the case with minerva with minerva our role differs like mine and jessica and pe- you know people like us at minerva their role actually differs and our role is to go and uh, look for the um, you know talent or the talented student that are, that that are out there you know it doesn't matter like you know if their parents are rich or not or you know i mean i i i can tell you like this is my i've been at minerva for the last four years and some of the african school, students specifically that have qualified for the program they could not even afford going to african university and imagine that they are completing their four years at at minerva i would also share some of the i mean i'm sure kunal might have your details i'm going to share some of the articles that have recently came came uh, uh, about minerva i think you guys should also look at those um you know i think we were recently compared with with the uh, harvard as the new harvard um there was an article about uh, like how if i mean you know the future uh, i mean i think it was very inter- interesting lead that if you if you want to be the bell, bill gates for future if you want to be um, you know some of the other uh, billionaires you would not i mean you would not actually try and create another microsoft or you would not try and create another harvard because i mean you know when it looks to, it it looks i mean when you look at the future then actually what you need now is a lot more different than when these guys have created those kind of uh, you know products and all so they compete minerva as like you know probably uh, something that is the new harvard or is going to be a new harvard and there's a lot of articles um, about minerva written by new york times to um, a lot of newspapers across uh, europe um, in the uk um, and you know we have students who have left um, a lot of huge names to be at minerva we have students who have left harvard to be with us we have students who have left stanford to be with us um and so on so you know i'm more than happy to share the, to connect them with you uh, they have posted youtube videos that you can go and have a look and try and see like you know why did they opt for this 
and what what have they gain uh, you know gain out of this and all so now thank you so much anything else that any i mean i could not see any questions actually uh, I no just... i think uh, i think those are only the questions that i can see and i think uh, we're done with time so i'm going to begin uh, with my conclusion uh, students parents guidance counselors who have joined us today thank you so much uh, we know again it's late so thank you so much for staying all throughout this session uh, we truly hope you enjoyed uh, uh, listening to mr navid and ms jessica on as you can see is a very novel program uh, that we all are being introduced to uh, it's a very new way of learning and i think it's something that is very fascinating and offers a lot of insights and depth into really making us think uh, in uh, in terms of the traditional education that we are you know also well acclaimed to and if there is you know how we can uh, adapt ourselves to a new style of education that will really help us uh, in the future having said that though i want to thank uh, mr navi dijaz and ms jessica vargis for taking their kind time and support in taking time out to meet with you today students parents counselors as you know this session is recorded and will be shared with your um with your schools so that other students who are not able to come in today uh, will be able to view the recording of this session and i'll also be sharing a copy with uh, mr navi and ms uh, jessica but thank you so much to the minerva schools at kgi for providing a very a fun i would say and cool and unique uh, 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 perspective so i think this is something very interesting i mean i've never heard of it but uh, really very fascinating you, you definitely uh, kept me well engaged and uh, i hope i'm hoping the students parents and counselors enjoy that too having said that i think it's a wrap for the day and we sincerely look forward uh, to keeping in touch with you and students will be receiving the link uh, within the next 24 hours as well so thank you so much mr navid i wish you uh, the very best i hope you and your family are doing safe and please take care and ms jessica please take care as well please stay safe and we look forward to keeping in touch with you so now thank and you so much thank you once again and right. like i said you know it's a service that you are you are doing at this time and you know uh, we are always here if you need any support from us Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. All again, once again. Okay. Bye, Jessica. Bye, Navi. Take care. Have a wonderful evening.